This is Sean Donovan, the Messiah of old school, the most bitter man in all of independent wrestling. I am a genius. I am a journeyman. But most importantly, I am your Messiah. And as that, you need to listen to the 2300 Wrestling Podcast. All your news, all your updates, and the best interviews around. This is the 2300 Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, D.B. Richards, alongside my sweet tea referee, Dave Keener. How's it going, everybody? Hopefully no relation to Mike. Yes, he is. Actually, that's my brother. Is he really? Yes. Mike's my older brother. I'm sorry to hear that. (laughs) Uh, Mike is a great guy. Mike is a great guy. Oh, yeah, big time, big time. I have a funny story. As I asked him, hey, would you call the show? He said, no, but I fully support you. That's what it is, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, I'll be afraid to go on the show too with you too. You know what I mean? (laughs) And our special guest is Sean Donovan, the man of standalone wrestling champion. Standalone champion. Are you standing alone? Yeah. I'm sitting sitting alone (laughs) right now, so. So, how are you doing today? I'm feeling good, man. That's great to hear. Feeling good. So, I want to start off the, for people that don't know who you are. Sure. Um, wh- who trained you? So, I uh, got my start in early 2001. Uh, I was actually trained uh, in the fundamentals by a local journeyman by the name of uh, Kevin Knight and another local journeyman who's a very close friend of mine, uh, Biggie Biggs, and uh, another gentleman by the name of uh, Michael Illions, who was known throughout the Northeast uh, as AJ Sparks, uh, you know, helped run IWF. He had uh, uh, AWC, uh, New Jack City Wrestling, was a big promoter in the uh, mid to late 90s, early 2000s, booked a lot of ECW talent when they were able to do independent shows. Uh, so I was taught a lot by them as far as, uh, you know, the, the fundamentals of the in-ring stuff, you know. Uh, what you don't see a lot in schools today is, you know, I was taught a lot of, you know, how to handle yourself outside the ring. Um, but then I was really taught a lot of psychology by Dr. Tom Pritchard, uh, Chris Candido, and uh, in part, and also Balls Mahoney. Uh, as the, you know, the two of them, Balls and, and Candido, were very close, and they used to live uh, in the South Jersey area. And they used to just come up to our school, and they used just, uh, I used to joke around, they used to throw their fanny packs on the ground and just get in the ring with us, and they would just, they would go all night long with us, they would sit and talk with us all night long uh you know we'd be at our school till sometimes three in the morning just learning and just listening so uh, i was grateful to be taught by uh those five individuals so what was the best advice they've given you so uh, chris candido had had two philosophies that he taught me um one was it's about the journey it's not about the destination yeah. uh, what he meant by that was go out there and wrestle every single match you can and leave it all in the ring don't leave anything to chance don't don't be lazy give them that paying customer everything you can give them. Um, you know, the other part that Chris Candido and a lot of veterans teach, they teach you a lot of things very early on that you may not understand, um, but they say at some point you're going to be in a car, at a point in a match, on your way to the ring, on your way back to the locker room. At some point, a little piece that they teach you is the light bulb's just going to click, and eventually you're just going to understand it. And that has happened to me along the way with a lot of things that a lot of veterans who were nice enough to give me advice including Chris and balls and uh, my old trainers gave me just sometimes I've been sitting in a car driving and light bulb just clicks okay now I know exactly what they meant because sometimes there are just certain things you can only talk about you can't teach right. you have to go through it and live it in order to fully understand what they mean by that so uh, that's you know those are the two big pieces of advice that I think I learned a lot early on that uh, to this day I still try to pass along to the young kids too that is the, that is a good thing um, so yes the question pet peeves like Mm-hmm. When I ref and stuff like that, I know a pet peeve for me is not wearing the black shoes or shirts tucked in. That's one of my pet peeves. For referees you're talking about? What's that? For referees you yeah, mean? Yeah. My brother always yells at me, make sure your shirt's tucked in and yes. everything else. But do you have any pet peeves when you're business, ring, fans, anything um, like that? Man, I, it's funny, after doing this for almost 20 years, I think I'd, I could write a book on pet peeves, at least that I have, but um, I understand what you're saying, and I, I am, um, my biggest pet peeve are those that not that do not take this profession seriously right. from every aspect in the world. I'll just throw the whole piece out there of, of referees. Referees that are just refereeing with a shirt untucked, wearing, you know, cargo pants or oh. sweatpants, um, just, you know, wearing dirty sneakers, or, you know, there's, and, and it, it 
may not be to the fault of that referee themselves. They may not have been taught correctly. So I don't want to go and assume. Um, but for those that have been in business a while, I think my biggest pet peeve is just being professional from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. I mean, your look, your gear, and everything that you do in the ring should be taken seriously. Uh, and I understand that we're in a different time in wrestling in the business. And I understand there's niches and things in the business that go on. I'm a traditionalist. That's the way I was brought up in wrestling. It's my belief in the business. Um, you know, is there room for different things to have fun in the ring and, and kind of have a play on the on the business itself? If it fits, great. But when it's done to death, on every show, uh, to me, I, I kind of feel like it's a little bit disrespectful, right. and maybe oh, that's maybe that could be my 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 uh, my bitterness coming out of being <laughs> in the business for so long. But you know, I I have a lot of passion for this business, and I've spilt a lot of blood, and I've cried a lot, and sweat a lot, and made a lot of sacrifices uh, in this business for this business. That I a lot of young kids today, I think, if they tried one tenth of the sacrifices that I've made, they probably bury their hair, hand, uh, head in the sand, and they probably just oh, crawl up and walk away so you know I, I've, I've sacrificed a lot so for me trying to give back and teach there's just so many different pet peeves that kind of just comes upon you but my biggest thing is always look professional from head to toe um, don't go out and buy the generic store-bought gear you know have some creativity or partner with someone who's a uh, you know a designer and have them create that and then take it somewhere to someone professional and have it made that's me See, one of mine has always been wiping the feet. Yeah. No matter, I could be on one match or three. Every single time I get in that ring, I wipe my feet. Yeah. Every single time. Yeah, there, there's a, that, that's an unwritten rule that's kind of taught very early on. Um, right. It should be taught early on. Um, some places I get it don't. Um, but places that don't probably don't really know much more after that. So. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I know my brother would always yell at me, you wipe your fucking feet? <laughs> That's a lie. So, no, I always wipe my feet. If you've no. ever seen me rap or do whatever I have I to see do, you I, always, I know you do. I always wipe my feet. Yeah, Mike, Mike is a very good guy, and he's someone that I've, I've learned a lot of knowledge with over the years in the, yeah. in, in the business, too. Just learning different things in terms of ring positioning. Just, you know, it's funny. I don't think Mike has refed a lot of my matches, even though I've been in a lot of locker rooms with him, but oh, yeah. um, just always there to give some solid advice with, you know, because he's, he's been everywhere, you know, and he's everywhere. seen it all done it all so yeah he's like, somebody i, I, I always would, listen to I would go in the back and he'd go what'd you screw up on what'd you mess up on <laughs> everything <laughs> oh yeah oh, damn all right so question um we're the 2300 wrestling we're named after the ecw arena mm -hmm. have you worked in the ecw arena it's funny yes i actually have had the opportunity only once to wrestle in that building and it was actually as what i consider the original ecw arena before it was torn down inside and yeah. remodeled i mean it's i rest there with the leftover smell of beer and popcorn yeah. and the crow's nest up top oh. and yeah, I had the opportunity to work. Uh, Blue Meanie uh, ran a small promotion for a little while called uh, 3PW. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was I called 3PW once. Yeah, they was yeah. called Power Pain Pro Wrestling, and he ran a few shows inside of the arena. Right. And very early on in in my trust, about a year into the business, um, uh, I was asked. Uh, he made a connection with. He needed two local guys. They were building a character that was trying to be like a second coming of 911. Okay. Um, <laughs> really nice guy, but when he took his trench coat off, he was about seven feet tall and about 110 pounds soaking oh. wet um so he needed some two guys to go in there and have a basic match and then the this guy was going to come out and interrupt and choke slam us both and you know that was that and uh, we were just told to go out there and do a basic uh seven to eight minute match i'm a year into the business i am a, a white meat baby face if you want to call it that and i don't know my ass from my elbow <laughs> so we said okay let's go out there and give them a dean malenko eddie guerrero style match Ugh. Yeah, watching that match back now, that's I, the only thing I could say is I had a pretty sweet uh, high cross body off the top rope. That's about it. In that building. <laughs> in that building. And when I tell you we were called every name in the book, names that today would probably land you in jail or just get you thrown <laughs> off of social media whatsoever. Oh, yeah. But you know, twenty years ago, that was a that was a different time. Um, Completely different time for wrestling. But it was it was an experience. Um, there's actually, if you got time, I got a funny story behind that. Yeah, uh, the mat. Thank God it was the match after ours. Public Enemy and the Rottens. Um, God rest Public Enemy Soul and, and Axel Rotten. They went out there and did one of the bloodiest hardcore tag matches I have ever seen in my life. And they tried to recreate the ECW spot where with uh, Funk and, and Cactus Jack, where all the chairs are thrown in the yeah. ring. Uh, I remember that. Yeah. 
And uh, later on in the evening, uh, another gentleman who, uh, I will just put it this way, the Rock and Rebel, uh, was uh, set to wrestle New Jack. And I guess both of them had an issue with how much the four of these guys bled. Mm. And these guys come back to the locker room. Ian Rotten's got like a $10 bill stapled to his forehead. And there's just EMTs tending to these guys. And Rock and Rebel comes in and throws a fit. And then New Jack comes in and throws a fit. Tables get knocked over. People's gear all over the floor. Sabu's gear is now filled with blood because his gear fell on the floor. is blood dripping all over it. New Jack used to carry a machete. <laughs> he took that machete and threw it across the room and didn't care who was in the way. I could not have packed my shit up fast enough. And I was, I literally, I didn't even care. I don't even think I got paid that night. I just wanted to get out of there because yeah. I'm young. I don't know anything about this business. I'm just told to keep my mouth shut and my ears open. Mm -hmm. I saw a machete flying. I was out the door, <laughs> literally. Oh, and I found my way to the crow's nest and sat there the rest of the night and watched the entire rest of the show. But hey, this uh, is your show, so yeah, you it, can you can bring up any story. No, you I want. appreciate it. That was that was a real it was a lot of it was a lot of fun, a lot of experiences. And to be a year into the business and to be in a locker room filled with that many guys you know, from a uh, renegade brand that I discovered in 1996 as a fan and could not believe here I am that many years later. I'm sharing a locker room with these guys. And it's yeah. funny, every time I see Shane Douglas, when I see uh, see him at um, USA Pro Shows out in Florida for Frank Goodman, mm -hmm. uh, I always have a good uh, good laugh with him about that because he just he's so giving with advice and, and loves hearing some of those stories. Well, he was, we were talking to him the one time, he cracked a joke with him. No, I didn't crack a joke. My, the story was like I was there to um, get an autograph from Shane. Icons. He goes, it's icons. And the first thing I said to him, I was like, he got up. I was like, wow, you're short. Because when I was a kid, <laughs> right. we were a lot shorter. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? And he's like, oh, everybody tells me that. And, yeah. And like, <laughs> like, I don't know if you know who Drew Blood is. Uh, I know the name. I don't think I've actually ever met I'm him. I'm friends with Drew. And I went in the locker room one time and I looked at him. And I said, dude, I don't remember you ever being that short. <laughs> Drew's about five foot four. Yeah. But he's such an amazing wrestler. Yeah. I mean, that's like guys that see guys like Dean Malenko or Eddie Guerrero. They were never even, you know, I'd say Chris Benoit. They were never really yeah. any taller than like yeah. five seven five eight but you would never know it from seeing the way they work on tv because they never worked small no. they worked their size but they also knew how to work every style and everybody else's size you never knew how short they were it's, it's like um randy savage he always worked on his on tip toes when you walk around yeah because he make thought himself he bigger, bigger yes yes yeah. and that's what's so great about right. wrestling. you were so focused on the personality and the yes. charisma you never paid attention to the fact that he was always on his tippy toes oh, you yeah. never noticed it yeah 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 so, so what, what let's, are you gonna say? let's talk about the match. Oh, let's talk yeah. about the match. Let's talk about the, the three-way match tonight we have mm -hmm. at Val's Pals. Brian Cage. Sean Donovan. Mm -hmm. And Ace TNA Austin. Superstar, Ace Austin. TNA. TNA, TNA Impact. Impact. Like, died I, years ago. I mean, yeah. he was still running around with the TNA titles. So. See, he, see, he's still back in, like, the older uh, days. Yeah, that's I'm okay. A lot, of, a lot of the guys in the locker room still think I'm, I, I wrestled Gorgeous George in the 1960s. <laughs> so you call, weren't? They call me. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't you? No, that was actually me. I wrestled George Hackenschmidt back in 1923. I was actually the guy that helped make the business today. So that's, that's the joke. I get in a locker room. So you're the Highlander. The, uh, yeah, basically, yeah. That's the joke I get from some of the guys in the locker room because I'm the older vet guy. I've got the gray in my beard, and they uh, they say I have the grizzled walk ready because my body's so beat up. So. <laughs> so let's talk about the match. What let's do we got? Let's talk about the match. What do you want to talk about? It? Let's talk you, about it. Yeah. So your thoughts on Ace Austin mm -hmm. and Brian Cage? Um, both of them are absolutely phenomenal athletes in their own way. Um, Brian Cage, I've never worked before, and I'm excited to get in the ring with him. I mean, he is a, uh, if I can curse on this, God. he's a shit brick house of a oh, guy. Yeah. He's solid as hell. For a guy his size, he is extremely agile. Uh, he's extremely strong. Um, very athletic for his ability and size. So I'm looking forward to see what, what you know, my style and his style can create. And, uh, you know, the same with Ace Austin. Um, you know, I, I cut a promo for the for the event, and, and I, I mean what I said. He Ace Austin is legitimately one of the most acrobatically and athletically um, sound performers this generation has ever seen. And I think he's, for a lot of buzz that people talk about some of the guys on 205 Live, I think Ace Austin is one of the guys that, that can really be... Uh, uh, 
that should be in that conversation. Uh, I had a chance to to work with him in New York uh, at one of the uh, impact tapings for Explosion, and even though it was only uh, you know an eight minute match, what we did in there I thought was uh, was really uh, fun and a clash of our styles, but it came out really well. So I'm excited to see what again what he and I can do with our abilities, uh, given a little bit more time and a platform today. So and just overall seeing what the three of our different styles can really you know, bring to a crowd. How was it working for Impact? Oh, Impact. Oh, a lot of fun. Uh, great opportunity. Uh, one of those things where uh, that evening was the first time I ever worked, uh, you know, for Impact. I've done extra work for WWE, but uh, I went there to just help set up and, you know, just network and meet people mm-hmm. and uh my the main company that i work with wrestle pro was helping to provide a lot of the materials like the ring and stuff like mm-hmm. that and uh they had room for one more explosion match and they needed someone as a heel that could go in there and, and really wanted to make ace look good and uh, ace at that time i don't think had a contract yet with impact wrestling mm-hmm. so uh you know i was asked to go in there and and you know uh have a particular role that night and uh got a lot of great feedback from the agents that I had for from back there. I uh, got a lot of praise from a lot of guys in the locker room like Sammy Callahan and uh, some of the other guys. So it was a great, great opportunity. You know, wish something maybe more could have come out of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I always say for everything, it's right place, right time, right opportunity. Yeah. The opportunity was there. I guess maybe it just wasn't the, the right place and the right time for something a little bit further. But uh, that's why we keep pushing. Oh, yeah. You said extra work for WWE. Mm-hmm. What did you do? Uh, so I did a majority of my extra work in the, the early 2000s. Uh, um, really, I, I, I never had a, a match uh, up until I had the match with Andrade on, on Raw back in last December, but always did a lot of extra stuff. I was always like a, a background security guy, yeah, yeah. somebody getting beat up, uh, things of that nature, or just somebody doing something in a, in a background piece, but never had the opportunity to uh, to work a match. Um, I used to do a lot of the uh, extra work back in the day with uh, Fred Rosser before he was Darren Young. He and I came from the same wrestling school, so anytime they were in the Northeast, uh, with Dr. Tom Pritchard being at the time the head of developmental and always looking at our school, a lot of our guys, uh, anytime they were in the tri-state area, we always had spots available for for extra work. Yeah. So um, I went up to the Pro Wrestling Magic, I think it was a couple years ago. Brian Pillman Jr. was on that card. Yep, um, I remember. He wrestled Danny Moff. Yes, and yes. That, that shot was like amazing, I heard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so much so that Brian talks about it. He legitimately shit himself. Oh, we talk about this every <laughs> time on the podcast. Dude, that's one of our questions. Man. That was yeah. one of our questions yeah. we one of the Danny Moff is one of my closest friends, and anytime we are hanging out or around other people, that story always comes up, and that gives us some of the biggest laughs. And even Ryan laughs about it too. So yeah. it's always a good story. I don't even remember who I worked on that night, though. I don't remember either, but that yeah. was the first time yeah. I met you. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. But you became a favorite of mine because how appreciate you it. worked, and I was like, oh my gosh, where? Why is he not signed anywhere? I appreciate. You should it. be somewhere, and and I hope somebody listens to. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I think my style is very, it's very different from what you're seeing today. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of it is because I am a traditionalist and uh, I don't think there are a lot of guys out there that are working my style. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it is that flashy, fast um, indie pace today. Right. Um, I like to slow that pace down, um, but I find every way that I can to work everybody's style into what I do. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully, you know, what results of it is a, a very entertaining match for all the fans. Yeah. Uh, but I think my movements, my look, the way that I work, the way I do certain things, the little things, I don't think you see that a lot today. And I'm not... Um, saying that with any type of egotistical nature. Uh, I'm just very confident in my nature and my ability in the ring um, that I stand out among a lot of different people you see inside of a a wrestling ring today, which I hate to say sometimes when you look at a lot of matches on shows, a lot of the talent is very cookie cutter. And I don't think a lot of talent today is really focused on really trying to stand out as much as I think everybody's just trying to be that awesome performer that hits cool moves. Uh, You know, I am a traditional I like story to be involved in there somewhere. And I think if you know and understand what you're trying to get across as a story, you find to put those really awesome and cool moves or sequences uh, in places that it 
makes a lot of sense when it comes to the story. Because to me, pro wrestling is not about the moves. It's about the emotion. It's about the story. It's about the intensity, the body language of the performers, and the facial expressions that should match all those different points that you're in a match. See, um, I was always told it was like a movie. Yeah. Hero versus villain. Yes. Yeah. And in that one scene, tell the story. Right. Make it look good. Yeah. Make and, that and, part of the movie. Right. And there's nothing wrong with what the style is. That today is a very gray area. There's a lot of incredible performers out there um, that are doing some really incredible things. But I think if we slow down just a little bit and just tell a little bit more of a story and let things breathe, uh, I think the reaction from the fans are going to be a lot bigger. Right, completely agree. Yeah, I, I agree big time too. But yeah, I, I was kind of cool. Like Frankie drove, um, got me, tried him, drew blood, and Devin Moore all the way up to the show. And that's and like he brought me in the back. He's like, introduce yourself to everybody. I'm like, uh. And then I saw you standing, and I was like, look at that style right there. And you're like, like who you were. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. I think I need to talk to him. Hi, I'm, I'm on the Instagram Network or podcast, and we changed everything because my old podcast host wanted to split up our shows. Okay. And he wants to do reviews. I want to do interviews. And you were one on the list. You know what I mean? I appreciate it very much. Thank there. you. Uh, anytime I get doing these, I'm very humbled. You know, I always consider myself a journeyman. I don't consider myself a, you know, a well-known name, even though my name is out there. But, you know, right. I call myself a journeyman because that is what I am. I've, I've, I've been at this journey for almost 20 years. You know, I, I, I'm not signed to a major company. So, you know, and, and I don't mind that moniker either. I don't mind calling myself a journeyman because, you know, that's what I am. So, and so you'll get your um, chance. Look at Pat Buck. He just, yeah. he just got in the WWE. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And I'm very grateful, you know, again, being with Wrestle Pro 2, you know, helped open a lot of doors for me too yeah. when I thought some doors were going to shut and uh, kind of gave me a, 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 a new, it, it helped breathe a, a new life into me a little bit. It helped me renew my, my passion and my love for the business because I, I got a chance through them to really work with some incredible people um, and to be part of a really uh, incredible locker room. So it really helped renew my love for the business. So very grateful for the opportunity Russell Pro has given me even up until today. You know? See, for me, for the love of wrestling, it's because my mom had cancer and wrestling was there for me. So yeah. everything was there. And I'm like, okay, I found out my mom was dying. Yeah, I walked down the I, hallway and I looked at the TV and Rick Rude was on there. I'm like, yeah. wow, where's this back? Yeah, and it I, was I, like WCW. I think everybody finds wrestling at different points in their life and they find a different reason why they love it. Obviously, yeah. you know, you have yours. And for me, uh, I was the overweight kid in school and wrestling, you know, was, I was bullied a lot uh, as a young Same kid here. and wrestling gave me that, uh, you know, it gave me that breakaway yeah. that I didn't, for that 60 minutes, I was watching, uh, you know, Saturday mornings, Sunday mornings. It, it gave me that breakaway that I can immerse myself in that world and yeah. nothing could hurt me. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's the same way even now being involved in the business. You know, we all go through different hardships in our in our personal life. Uh, you know, I've dealt with a lot of stuff. And, you know, when I put on that gear and I get in that ring, yeah. you can't hurt me. I'm invincible with anything yep. in that right. You know, I am invincible and you can't hurt me, you can't touch me. And because I have such a passion for this business, that's why I continue to try and change my look, evolve my style, evolve my body. Yeah. Uh, I want to be that guy that can say, hey, Hey, I am, you know, and I'm going to date myself here. You know, I'm not a spring chicken, but I can run circles around some guys that are half my age. Um, and I'm not one of those old carny veterans that would give you just a little bit of knowledge because they were afraid that if they gave you too much, you would take their spot. I'll give you all the knowledge in the world. I say come from my spot because I'm not going to give it up that easy. Yeah. When you were a kid, who was your favorite wrestler? So uh, I always say this, I gravitated a lot towards the villains because yeah. I was bullied yeah. and I thought there was a certain power in that. So I always gravitated to the villains because of how they could beat people up and get away with it. Yeah. Right. But I kind of hated it because I got beat up as a kid and yeah. kids got away with it. So, <laughs> um, But for me, it was it was, uh, it was was Arn Anderson, uh, the Million Dollar Man, okay. Jake Roberts when he was a villain. Um, and the only really, the only uh, the only hero that I ever liked was the Ultimate Warrior. Okay. And a lot of it was really just because of his look. Yeah. The music, the face paint, the tassels, the body. Um, I he just was like was, a superhero. Yeah. And yeah. for some reason, I just could never get into his matches past his entrance. And of course, <laughs> I hate to say it, years later, I understood why. Yeah. Um, not that he was bad, but, you know, he was just one of those guys that needed, he needed somebody to really help him have those great matches. He was a phenomenal yeah. performer in his yes. own way. But I think to really have those standout matches, he needed somebody that knew his strengths and could hide his weaknesses. And that's somebody what, like Macho Man did that for him. Somebody like right. Hulk Hogan did that for him. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's just how.
how it is in the movie. Not everybody is going to be the greatest performer there is, but sometimes when you match two people together, it's uh, magic. Always, always, yes. Not pro wrestling magic, but it's magic. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, I totally understand that, yeah. I'm, so um, let's, get, let's go to one of our questions back sure. in time. Um, would you change your career anyway or just keep it how it is now? It's funny. On one end, I would say that I wouldn't change it because I truly believe that everything in life happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big believer in that. You know, for example, if you get into a fender bender in the parking lot somewhere, I truly believe that that's God's way of saying that he's protecting you from something that could potentially be dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, totally agree. I, I totally believe that. But at the same token, there, there was a point in my career where I was very burned out yeah. um, and I took some time off and I I don't want to, I don't regret it anymore. At the time I did, I, I took some time off, was going through a lot of different personal things and, uh, you know, in that time, I watched three of my, my closest friends get signed to WWE contracts. So at that point in time, I said, well, man, if I just stuck with it, maybe I would have been there. But you could always say shoulda, coulda, woulda. At the end of the day, life works out the way that it's supposed to. Yeah. Um, and to be sitting here right now and knowing where I am in wrestling and knowing where I am in my personal life, um, I wouldn't change it. Because yeah. if my life didn't go on the path that it did, I wouldn't have the life that I have right now. I, so I totally agree about that. Like if you're on the side of the road, yeah. so somebody's protecting you. Yeah, so I truly I believe, like, yeah, I truly yeah. believe everything happens in reason, uh, happens in life for a reason. You know, I was meant to have the life I have outside of wrestling. I'm meant to have the life I have in wrestling right now. And yeah. I truly believe that if bigger things are meant for me, it's going to happen. And yeah. I just keep that same mentality. It's about the journey. It's not about the destination. Oh, yeah. yeah. Any question? I took all the questions. I want to yeah, see if you want to get some. Okay. So we have this question called Table of Five. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the fifth person. Okay. If, like, we had Lance on a while on the show, and he said it would be his whole family, his dad, his mom, mm -hmm. his uncles, and all that. Um. So you being the fifth person, who would four the, the, four people, the people, who would you want to have a beer with, maybe go to dinner with, have a nice little conversation with? Dead, wow. live. Um, wow. That's, be, that, that's, that's, that's a really interesting question. That is a really interesting. I've never thought about that before. So We get that reaction yeah. all the time. That I, I'm going to freestyle it's this. almost okay. like yeah. the shit question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to freestyle it. So, okay, I'm the fifth guy. I need four people I can yes, have a beer right. with. Okay. Number one uh, has to be Terry Funk. There you go. He is my all-time great. To me, he's the goat of wrestling. Uh, I would say number two, Bruiser Brody. That's a good one. And the guys I'm naming are guys I've never had a chance to have a conversation with. Oh. Number three uh, would be Arn Anderson. Okay. And uh, number four, I would have to say, uh, would be Kurt Hennig. There you go. I like that yeah. list. So our friend George right here, um, his mom drove ECW wrestlers around back in the day. Who was your mother? Maureen um, Clark. I didn't know that name. I, I, it's funny. There's, and I said with all due respect, because I've heard so many names of people that have driven a lot of talent around the Northeast, like uh, Kathy Fitzpatrick yes. has been around for ever and I've heard of the name Mel uh, Georgia Macropolis who mm -hmm. yeah. was a long time writer too did uh, you know she was doing wrestling figs up until she unfortunately passed yeah. away and I think uh, Bob Mulrennan does a lot of that work now he's the photographer and does a lot there so I've, yeah. I've heard the name before so Mel um, always drove Terry and they always talk back and forth They she always called him dad she always call, called her daughter it was kind of cool you know what I mean so like when she said that to me I'm like yeah sure you know Terry yeah. Funk you know people always right. say they know someone right and then when i met him i'm like oh she knows mm -hmm. terry funk i got his autograph and mm -hmm. and um got a picture taken with him he tried to trip over a handicapped person <laughs> and trying to take a picture it was that's like that's absolutely fantastic and, and like i turned to him i was like see right there that's hardcore that's and terry it. left that's great. And it was great meeting Terry, talking yeah. to him, and oh my gosh, dude's awesome. You know what yeah, I mean? That's so, everything I hear. I've never heard a bad thing about him. Here's an alternate. I had a friend named Dustin. He passed away of cancer. And um, Mo um, called up Terry. He's like, hey, can you call talk to Dustin? And he's dying, and he calls up Dustin. First time, Dustin doesn't answer the phone because he's like, who do I know who lives in Texas? You know what I mean? So he didn't answer the phone. And then Mo calls him up. He's like, answer the phone if somebody's calling from Texas. And then she, um, he picked up the phone. Terry talked to him. They didn't talk about wrestling. They talked about living life and beating cancer. And that was, that means so much to me by Terry. I told him thank you and everything. I appreciate and, you sharing that, man. That's an oh, awesome yeah. story. So Mo passed away two years ago, his mom. So I, I, I like to bring her up in stories and all that. And Dave wants to say hi to Slayer and everybody. Okay. So 
that's an awesome story about it. You got any stories? No, oh, that's great. It's funny yeah. just to throw in a little caveat of that too. It's funny to talk about if you have four guys that you'd want to sit have a beer with. If I'm sitting at a bar, yeah. uh, if there's somebody that I didn't miss that was at a bar that needs to come over and sit down, it's got to be Dick Murdoch. Oh, Dick Murdoch. Yes. I've heard a number of stories about that, man. It's funny. Talk about guys you sit around and have stories with. Uh, getting the opportunity to team with Danny Ma for a while, we got a chance to work the Rock and Roll Express up yes. in, in New York. And I'm like a little kid in a can. We both are because we love hearing stories and the, the passion, the history behind the business. We are sitting in this locker room in New York on next to me is Shane Douglas mm -hmm. and then the Rock and Roll Express oh uh, and then uh, Kevin Sullivan mm -hmm. and they are all telling road stories of, of trying to outdo each other's story of who came the closest to getting arrested for something illegal in their <laughs> car and I am just sitting there like a kid in a candy store just listening to these stories wishing I'd just be a, a fly on the wall with these guys so yeah. uh, I, anytime uh, and I always try to preach this to young kids too just bringing this up anytime you have someone that has been somewhere in this sport yeah. you are doing yourself an injustice if you do not at some point introduce yourself and pick their brain I did that on a show the first time I ever met Jake Roberts he did a little seminar with our guys and we're waiting about three hours before the show starts and he's just sitting in the corner just relaxing you know just getting dressed and all the other guys are just hanging out and they're not and I'm Talking, thinking yeah. they're not and I'm just I rub my hands together I'm like I'm going over there yeah. and I pulled up a chair and I just asked Jake a simple question about a certain line that he had in one of his most famous promos and he legitimately turned that into a 45 minute conversation teaching me about promos and how he would develop his promos his style his cadence and evolving my style over the last year yeah. a lot of my cadence is Jake Roberts now it's yeah. certain wording it's the way he conveys it doesn't right. scream he doesn't yell he just talks to you it's yeah. that monotone yeah the way he just talks it, it right maybe he and everything else like yeah. i refereed for steve carino when carino had 3kw up in north pa mm -hmm. jerry lynn came in and yeah. i'm like you know what it's jerry lynn when am i going to have a chance to talk to jerry lynn again right and oh. i just sat there and we just talked about fundamentals of wrestling for a good 45 minutes an hour and yeah matches. And it, it was just i really always great. say pull the guy that's why and again i know uh, out in florida frank goodman always brings a lot of that legend every town in there. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I've just pulled up a chair next to Manny Fernandez and just listened. Yeah. Tito. Tito you know? Santana was at a show for ECWA and I was at him just like, Another I was even guy. on the show and I just sat there and talked to him the whole time. There, there's so much rich history and so many things to learn from some of these guys and even if you sat there for 45 minutes, if you got just one thing out of it, you never know where it's going to take you. And like I said, I, right. I started using a lot of his cadence in my promos and you know, he talked about how he would develop some of the, the ideas he would get from listening to different uh, lyrics from different bands like The Doors and Janis Joplin and he would start, you know, reading certain types of poetry and I just started researching I'm like wow there's so much content here that at this point I'm, I'm in the business 15 16 years and I never even thought to even look at and all of a sudden it just mind blown and now I'm just I read everything yeah. all the time I, oh yeah guys some of the guys want to call me really old school I sit there I do crossword puzzles because there's just certain <laughs> words you get from it like oh I didn't this is an awesome word you don't ever hear this word being used in a promo <laughs> and when somebody hears it and they see we're like wait what's that mean and they go when they reach like oh okay so a lot of different things you can learn so i always yeah. tell young guys if you have somebody in the locker room that has been somewhere and it's done something in this sport you'd be a fool to not pick their brain oh yeah oh my gosh that's freaking yeah. awesome so um road stories you mm -hmm. have any cool road stories that you can tell us oh yeah i mean there's there's tons i can tell i guess the the, the funniest one that i i think is i think it's funny now at the time uh you know it wasn't I mean, there's two i'll tell so uh i was on a road trip to work for a company in Rhode Island called XWA. Um, really awesome company out there. Mike Antonucci runs a phenomenal ship out there. And I'm riding in this car with uh, with Falaba and Danny Moff. We stop at a rest stop. Go into the big bathroom in the urinals. You know, I'm literally, and I, I literally have my zipper halfway pulled down. <laughs> so I have no way. Out of nowhere, here comes Falaba like a head of steam of a splash, splashes me into the wall. <laughs> 
my hands were to protect myself, so my face hit the wall and broke oh. one of my teeth. Oh. But it hit my head so hard that I actually was like kind of out of it for a minute. That when I got up, I was looking to fight somebody. I almost actually wanted to fight a cop. Oh. <laughs> um, so that was pretty funny. It was was not them because at the end of the day, I had a nice uh, nice dental bill uh, that he still has not chipped in for, and uh, he will at some point. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> and Fallon, and I always have a, uh, we're, we're, I've known him for 15 years and he's a phenomenal performer. He's even better friend. Uh, we always try to mess with each other in matches if we're in them. But, uh, you know, one of the other stories is again, I've always, I know ribs really aren't a thing in wrestling anymore, which I, especially harmless ones that are fun. I think everybody, our society is so different now that, that guys <laughs> are, aren't as lighthearted as they used to be. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just cause the generation is younger, but I was doing a, a show, uh, early on in, in Pennsylvania and, and. I'm sure Mike Keener knows him. Um, it was a gentleman who ran. Uh, it was a, he was a journeyman too. His name was Rapid Fire Maldonado. Yeah, no um, really, really nice guy. Had a great outfit out in PA. Uh, one of the first places outside of my school that I could work. And he used to run these shows in legitimately the second floor of a barn. And so we're doing this show. We pull up and there's legitimately cows outside. And this is 2002. Again, I'm a, a year and a half a in. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, and it was like a student show. And they literally had on the bottom floor, they had like a little gym set up, but there were no curtains. And they just put <laughs> heels on one side and faces on the other. And there's fans <laughs> just walking right through, you know. So you got a kayfabe every five seconds. And, it's like uh, the LAW show. So um, one of the guys there taught me a trick and and uh, a, a, a small rib. So apparently it's told to me that if you mix lotion with mayonnaise, it becomes extremely slippery. So uh, one of my buddies was really annoying me at the time. So during his match, I went out and I brought these things with me intentionally. And I, I mixed it together and he had one of those old school, call them old school now, cars where that you had to put your fingers underneath the handle to lift up to open open the door mm -hmm. yeah. so I put an immense substance amount on there and he's sitting there trying to open the door <laughs> and his hand keeps slipping off it keeps slipping off he finally gets a grip like the and I'm watching like a kid in the bushes and I'm trying not to laugh he pulls it so hard he rips the handle right off his driver's <laughs> side door what did you do oh my I mean yeah there's so there's a lot of fun stories I I caused somebody to uh get a get a uh, uh, a ticket a uh, $500 ticket and you know yeah, there's some fun <laughs> That a lot of stuff I can too. I can tell. So I mean, but yeah, there's some fun stories. Uh, there's been stuff involving, uh, you know, a seven inch uh, foreign object, you know, that flops around. It's been passed along. It's, you know, yeah, we'll save that if this is a family I, show. So. I, am, <laughs> I am a big I am a big fan of ribs. Oh yeah. So um, but he just I never yeah, and I, know, I never I and I never meant never meant for any of my ribs to be um, harmless. Yeah, they're harmless. They're, I yeah. mean, and the other one funny story I tell you there's there's another gentleman who he's not wrestling anymore. His name is uh, Jason. Karloff, okay. wrestled for Warriors of Wrestling, and he started with our school. He was about three years prior to me, so, you know, when you're a young kid and, and getting a lot of work that I was, getting extra work at the time, yeah. you know, we all go through that period of time where we think we're stars and we're better yeah. than everybody and, and all that, and, you know, Jason was a little weird at the time, and he was young, and I didn't know any better, and uh, my old buddy of mine, we used to use this stuff, I mean, people see what they call hot stuff, yeah. and it's a vasilodizer that brings out your uh, vascularity. Yeah. And if you're nicely tanned, it actually makes a nice tan. If you're not really tan and you're kind of pale, it'll turn your skin really red. Yeah. So Jace was doing like this, uh, like uh, vampire type gimmick where he had a trench coat and he wore a big top hat. <laughs> so I had the bright idea to take hot stuff and spray it all around the rim oh. of his top hat. Oh my so God. he goes out, does his whole entrance, and everything takes off the hat. There's a giant red oh. halo ring on his <laughs> forehead. Oh. And he ends up, somebody alerted him to him and wanted to fight. He knew it was me. And of course, I'm, I'm a river. I deny it. You know? yeah. And just he wanted to fight me. And my, my trainer gave me a lot of hell for it. You know, it's just, you know, it's just fun, harmless things. And even now, sometimes I, I'll joke around with, you know, with some of the guys I I know that can handle the ribs. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to go out and mess with anybody that that's not, you know, into stuff like that. I rib so. him every time. <laughs> 
<laughs> he has pop. Oh, yeah. He has he has I pop toys yeah. everywhere. So I I started moving uh, moving his pop toys in different sections <laughs> of the house, and like yeah. and then I taught his um his girlfriend's kid to start doing it too. Okay, and he's go. getting pissed off. Oh, I get yeah, phone calls going. What oh, did yeah. you do? What did you teach him? Oh yeah, and it, it just cracks me up every time. Oh yeah, I mean it, it, even Danny Moff and I we see each other so so often, and we just we always rib each other. And he's somebody that has a giant sneaker collection, always has to match the. <laughs> Color of his sneaker with his shirt when we go work out, and I always find a different way to just rip him because he'll he'll be in the greatest mood in the world. And I'll walk into the gym and I'll be waiting for him. Like, why do you look like a giant stop sign? He's like, what are you talking? I'm like, dude, what do you? And, he, and of course, that just gives him like because I know I can mess with him like that, and he'll just be pissed off at me the whole workout. So I know he's just gonna destroy me in that workout. So it's, you know, you just when you're good friends with people, um, the rib should matter. You know, I think the best rib that was done to me very early on, again, coming from the same school as Robbie E, uh, Rob Echoes, Robbie Yeah, he tagged yeah, with a friend of, ours, friend of mine, Billy Bax, George yep. Baxter. I remember Billy Bax, another yeah. ECWA, PA guy, great yeah. great performer. He, yeah, he... I'll, um, I'll tell you a funny story about George. Yeah, please. Okay, um, we were playing street hockey in my neighborhood. We're from Chichester, Pennsylvania. And, um... And, like, one of the guys shot the thing and went through the side of the net. And I was like, no goal. And, like, the one kid got so mad, he gets his net, brings it inside. Out for nowhere, he, the garage door's closed. Here's George picking up the door and oh breaking the God. door and all that to get the net back That's outside. incredible. Yeah, I was early on in my training, and Rob had been wrestling, I think maybe he started about a year prior to me. And uh, outside of our school what is the Passaic River. Um, it's like a little warehouse area. I go in one day, and I guess, you know, new guys, the new guys are the ones to pick on. So, yeah. you know, I didn't know anything better. I go to find my bag. It's Sunday practice, so we're done by, like, 4. <laughs> and I go to get my bag. I can't find I left my bag in the vestibule area. I'm like, where the hell's my bag? <laughs> and Rob's like, oh, I thought I saw it outside. I said, Rob, I don't see my bag. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's outside. You just got to look for it. I'm like, what do you mean look for it? He's like, I think I saw it over by the trees, by the water. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> And I had a duffel bag. Yeah. So I go over and I look for it. I don't see it. I look ahead. My bag is floating in the Passaic River. <laughs> oh, shit. So I'm like, thank God. I mean, obviously, in there was a pair of wrestling shoes, shorts. Eh, it's probably about $100 yeah. worth. But, you know, it is what it is. And that was just one of those things. They, You know, a lot of times you're new. They try to test you. Yeah. Are you going to just take it and roll with it? Or are you going to be one of those crybabies, complainers, if you want to call it that. So they're trying to test you, you know. And obviously at right. that time, too, uh, wrestling schools weren't necessarily at that time. And I'm not saying all wrestlers were like this because the more students that come out of a wrestling school that can make it to a national scene does wonders for the credibility of that school. Yeah. My school at that time was not looking to take any students in as a quote-unquote weekend warrior. Yeah. They wanted guys that wanted to make it because it increased the credibility of that school. Yeah. So so that was kind of a thing there. They wanted to test you to see what your personality was. Are you just going to keep your head down and keep grinding? Or are you going to be a complainer? Because if you complained, if you no sold the rib, yeah, they're going to stop. If you keep selling the rib, you're going to keep going. Oh, yeah. So I was taught that, thank God, like my first weekend by Biggie Biggs. And I just, I looked at Bessay River. I went, all right, this is where it comes down to. I just walked right back in. I said goodbye to everybody. Showed his hand. I, I popped out. So I thought they ever ripped me. So there it is. That's the way it is. I remember, I remember Biggs and AJ and all those guys back. They were good people. I remember being at my brother's wedding and Ken Porter and Harley and Derek and Biggie and yeah. all of them were at the wedding. And I'm like, it's like, a, are we at a show or are we at a wedding? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's one guy I would love to have a conversation with. Harley Lewis. Yeah. And I, and hilarious to, to, to see him on Facebook, the stuff he puts up. Uh, always a legit fan of his. I, I remember going to indie shows. Uh, in the mid '90s and late '90s, and seeing all these guys, and I'm like, "Wow, these guys are." Yeah. They, the, the indies were really what taught me that you didn't have to have this television cookie cutter look right. to be a performer. Because I saw guys of all different shapes and sizes throughout the mid to late '90s, and I'm talking guys like Judas Young, Twiggy Ramirez, Biggie Biggs, all Derek Madonna. Domino, Madonna, Felipe the Pool Boy. Again, my trainers, Kevin Knight, other guys, Flash Wheeler. Adam, I can name mid-90s guys all day long across I mean, the independence. The, the Wildwood shows we did back yeah. then. Because I was at those Wildwood shows hanging out mm -hmm. and it was like Derek and Harley yeah. and Felipe and Judas and, and Nova, guys of, yeah. Donnie. 
yep, guys of all different shapes and sizes, right. and that that really is what really pushed me to say, okay, I really wanna really wanna do this because I was, I said I was the overweight kid, and you know, yeah. it just told me that I okay, if I get my butt in shape, I don't have to have a six pack of abs, and here I am, twenty years later, I don't think I've ever had one ab come through on camera, which I'm totally <laughs> fine with. That's not the, I mean, from my look and the way I work in the ring, right? They, if I was ripped and had a six pack, it wouldn't match what I'm doing in there. So I mean, I was bullied all throughout school, and then I see those guys now when I come and do this mm -hmm. and they're like Billy you're doing this and they all look like shit yeah <laughs> Truth be told, that's the way it is. Right. Yeah, I, I remember um, I'm good friends with Brian Sosha from ECWA. I love Brian. Awesome guy. Yeah. Awesome guy. Um, I, awesome grew up, guy. I grew up with him doing, I'm doing the camera work for Backyard Wrestling with him back in the day. Okay. But, um, you grew up with him, I grew up with Greg. Yeah, that's, that's the funny. funny part, yeah. So, like, he's telling me stories left and right, and it's fun. Like, he knows because that's what we did, you know what I mean? Telling us stories about, um. Him going down doing um, work on WWE stuff, and he's a good guy. I was at his wedding, and awesome. it was amazing that who he put me ne um, next to was the Chick right. Magnets. And, yep. and Chick Magnets were three guys I would have loved to get in the ring with at one point, and I, I've never had the opportunity to. I did get a chance to wrestle Mozart one time. Uh, for uh, Right Coast Pro um, yeah. out in PA with J.J. Johnston. And, man, what a hell of a performer he is, man. When you have two guys that have the same mindset that just want to go out there and just work. Oh, yeah. And that was a lot of fun. But I wish I could have uh, had a chance to work the whole team because they, yeah. were, they were awesome. So well, That's like oh. Greg. Greg and Teddy. Oh, yeah. The ECWA Tag Team Champions. Yeah, they well, Those guys have been around for a long yeah. time, but they can still go. They're two really great guys. And yeah, Mozart can still go because I know he, he uh, is the one that's training a lot. A lot of the students with JJ and the EC, the uh, Red Coast Pro School. So yeah. uh, Mozart's right. another guy. What he's, I, I would venture to say he. And I, I tell you, say this with a lot of pride. There are not a lot of guys left yeah. from that early 2000s era that I broke mm -hmm. into that are around now doing it at the level that I'm doing it at, at the consistency that I'm doing it at. Mm -hmm. And I take that with a lot of confidence and a lot of pride with it because I don't think there's a very large percentage of guys, especially on the East Coast, yeah. that, that are doing it. And I take a lot of pride in that. I mean, I still talk to Reckless and I still talk to Ace and they're like, I don't know if I want to. Yeah. I mean, they're two really great guys, but... Reckless is, is a guy that's always been on my bucket list for a long time, and he was on his way out when I was yeah. in my way in. So I think I was on one or two events with him uh, back I, in the I day, started, and that was it. I started ring announcing for PWF, and one of the first shows I did, it was Reckless... Chris Kruger and somebody else. Somebody maybe else maybe I got to heckle Donnie B to try and find yeah. a way to get reckless out of right. <laughs> retirement. And all of a sudden, it's like 2002, 2001, and yeah. reckless is like, I don't know anymore. Yeah. It's a, a great guy. I still talk to both of them. And yeah. It's great that we're naming people. Yeah, there's like. a lot of guys. It's funny if you want to even, even name stories, too. One of the first guys that ever taught me how to, how to uh, fix a wound without having to go to the hospital was Don Montoya. Oh, Don. Don Montoya. I he, I, I got my eyebrow. It's funny. He's here today. Is he? Where? No, Don, not Don Montoya. This gentleman is oh. here today. Slayer. Yeah, yes. Slayer. Who I think I ended right up now. in every battle royal for NWA New Jersey with Dapper Johnny and Gino Moore. <laughs> he some, uh, somehow or whatever, he and I would always end up in the battle royals together. We did a battle royal outside of a skating rink. And this is like a 20 match show. This <laughs> battle royal is legitimately going on in the dark with only two spotlights. Oh, and gosh. And... One of the guys in there catches me with an errant forearm that catches me right here, Ow. splits my eyebrow right open, Slayer throws me out, and the thing is I'm supposed to now grab him and toss him out from out of the ring. We're supposed to brawl to the back. Was it like the um, Hogan Sid? Uh, sort finish? of, yeah, that did not go anywhere near as good okay. as that one did. But So we're supposed to brawl to the back, and they had a concession stand where they were making ices. He throws me into the concession stand with all of the crushed ice. <laughs> there is blood all over the ice. <laughs> <laughs> I have to find Slayer because I've always uh, I love Slayer. He's a great dude, man. He's been around longer than me. He's still in ripped shape for for you know for being almost sixty. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I was gonna say close to seventy, but hey, you know. <laughs> I remember. Well, kill me, but I, I'm I'm dating back. So I was a manager of a tag team back in early 2000s called the TV Gen. It was me, Maverick, Norm the Barfly, Frank Cody, and Biggie Brad. We came up here, and it was when Tom Runsby was running out of Barnegat, that whole area. Right. 
and great locker and great people, and Slayer was one of them. So we came up here in January for one of the standalone shows at the um, Fire Hall. The, yeah, with Killer Carlson. With Killer Carlson on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm looking at him, and I go, Slayer? He goes, where the hell oh, do I know you Oh, that was the show I worked uh, Joe Gacy. Yes, 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 yes that was yes, an awesome yes, match. Yes, yes. So, happy, very happy for Joe Gacy. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah. Looked at him and he went, I know you. I'm like, yeah, it was through the wrestling shows. He's like, you were fatter back then. I'm like, yeah, you were younger too. <laughs> it's yeah, okay. So it's, like it's, it's funny. So I go to the locker room and Dom on top, I'm like, oh shit. I'm looking around. Like, Damn, this, you can literally like open this up. And I'm like, oh God. You know, and at that time, I'm, I'm only 20 years old. I'm still living at home. I'm like, oh my parents are going to kill me. <laughs> you know, my mother had reservations of me getting in the business. So it is. And Dom was like, oh, he's like, how long have you been wrestling for? I'm like, I'm only in bed like two years. He goes, so you don't know the trick on how you can fix that without going to the hospital? I'm like, no. He's like, come here, kid. Uh, I, I, I. So I was introduced on how to seal a wound shut with crazy glue. Yes. Yes. I heard about that. Yeah. And he's like, oh, it won't hurt at all. <laughs> I don't think I've ever screamed bloody murder putting whatever that chemical is. And he's like, yeah, once I put it on, just squeeze your eyebrow tight and hold it there for like five minutes. <laughs> okay, so I'm holding it there, holding it, I open it, and it opens right back up again because it's that deep. Yeah. I'm like, I over, I'm like, Don, it's it's still there. He's like, we'll apply a little bit more. <laughs> so he's rigging me as he's teaching me because he only literally put like a dab. Yeah. Thinking, I'm thinking he put like a whole line across and he didn't. So he did the second time around and, you know, of course, I'm trying to hide this. My mother sees the next thing. She's like, what the hell did you do? I'm going to use the word, but uh, it's funny. You can't see it, but within my eyebrow, there's a nice little scar that's in there. So, and that's a, a nice little reminder of my uh, my up, upbringings in the in the business. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I always said to people, if, if, my, if my journey in this business ends tomorrow, I am totally at peace with everything I've done. I've gotten to travel a lot of states that I've never been to. I've gotten to work with a lot of people that I would have never dreamed I would have worked with. You know, guys that I grew up idolizing and getting advice from. So I'm I'm content, man. I, I, I'm a happy camper in this business. I got no complaints. I, 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 I got a... Um I um I stitches up here. I was talking yeah, to people. Yeah, I yeah. turned around and I walked right into a pole. Didn't know the pole was there. <laughs> so that, sure shot for me. I, I do that at night when I walk into the wall, thinking that I'm actually in a clear line of sight to the bathroom. <laughs> and of course, as soon as I hit the wall, I've got to sell it and put it over too. So it keeps my selling strong. Do we do we have a last question? Just wish him well. The match, the three way vows, vows. And- Hold on, Val. How how did you get oh, to yeah. know Val? So it's funny. I've I've been to these shows and I've actually yet to officially meet Val. I no. know the story. Yeah. Um, so when it was approached to me to be a part of the event, I gladly said yes, absolutely. We did absolutely. I hope that. I hope I get the opportunity yeah. to meet him today. I have actually I brought a little present for him, so this is you know a show for him. So yeah. I want to make sure that he is welcomed by everybody on the roster. Here. My yeah. actual day job, besides doing this, is a drug care provider. Okay. So I take care of three or four people at any time in a house. Like Val. And it sitting there watching TV with them, joking, even though none of my guys can talk. Just seeing them smile and know what I'm talking about is just really freaking cool. That's awesome. My brother's that's handicapped. That's the first thing I jumped on. I was like, okay, I'm going to put $150, sponsor a podcast, yeah. a match. And well, I appreciate that you guys. You guys are here doing. I appreciate you sponsoring the event. You know, I, I'm I'm very humbled to be a part of the event. I have cannot tell you how many times over the years I was a part of what they called benefit events that oh, yeah. never really turned out to be yeah, benefit, benefit yeah. events. And I always felt like it was a bad uh, a bad little blip on my name. Yeah. Um. But to see that this is a legitimate benefit event and there's paperwork to prove it, uh, I'm more than happy to be a part of this. And uh, you know, I'm looking forward tonight. And it's and it's. Again, I'm humbled to be a part of it, but I'm also humbled to be part of the main event for an event like this. So uh, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give it 100% like I always do. And I hope everybody is uh, satisfied and entertained. And then before we um, end this, um, every, when everybody that comes on to our show, we always say welcome to the family. So welcome to the family. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I greatly anytime, appreciate it. Anytime you want to come on, talk shit, do appreciate whatever. Appreciate it, man. I love talking shop. I love yeah. talking about the old days of the business and the new days that are right now. So. Because there's more questions in my head, and I'm like, and we're getting to the time. Awesome. I don't want to have you on all no, I appreciate like, it, man. Hey, if I had all day, I would. So right, yeah. Cool. So we'll try to do this again at some point. Absolutely, man. man. I would love to do it. We can talk more. Okay. okay. So thank you, Sean Donovan. I am DB Richard. I'm Dave Keener. We just had Sean Donovan on, and we'll see you in. We'll see you in the ring. There we go. <laughs>